All right, I'll give a, try to give a short definition. The term triracial isolate is not a nice term. It was invented by uh, eugenicists. But it, is, uh, uh, it, it does actually des describe the situation, of at least of some of these groups. Um, the idea of race mixing, however, uh, was an obsession with the eugenicists. And they saw race mixing perhaps where, in fact, hadn't really very occurred to any deep extent. Some of these groups are, you know, they may be, in fact, completely black or completely white or completely Indian, but uh, they've acquired a reputation through um, the misunderstanding and prejudice of their neighbors and the, the, the uh, pseudoscience of eugenics uh, as triracial. You know, usually, so it's black, Indian, and white would be the three races here in the New World. And the white people are, uh, well, around here, for example, they were Dutch. And we presume that they were uh, uh, Dutch people without much clout or caste. You know, they were, and maybe they were outsiders. Uh, and they went up, went up and lived in the hills. Maybe they married uh, uh, black or Indians, that's possible. In some cases, they definitely did. Uh, but in any case, they, be, they would become a sort of a separate people. Um, a friend of mine grew up in a part of Pennsylvania where there was one of these groups, and she said they had their own language even. I mean, it, wasn't a la it was a dialect, and it was hard, hard for other people to understand them when they talked amongst themselves. So very closed in, you know, and sometimes for centuries they kind of vanish. But in the 19th and then in the 20th century, when everything became known, you know, when there were no more hidden places, uh, these groups would become known uh, outside their own little area. Usually in the area, you know, they would be looked on as inferior types, weird, hillbillies, incestuous, up in the mountains there, you know, they talk funny, that kind of thing, you know. And then the eugenicists came along and said, oh, it's much worse than that, <laughs> you know. These are actual race mongrels, you know, and we have to have all the men have to be, have to have vasectomies, you know. And the laws were passed in America to do this. And guess who liked those laws? You guess who thought those laws were brilliant? The Germans. And the Germans modeled, the Nazis modeled their race laws on American law. And during the Nuremberg trials of Nazi scientists, they were going to take these, these German eugenicists and hang them when a brilliant defense lawyer, an American actually, I forget his name, got up and said, but wait, if you prosecute these people on their race laws, you're going to have to arrest a whole lot of Americans too because these laws are word-for-word -word translations of American laws, which are still on the books. And in many cases, these laws have never been taken off the books. They're not used very much anymore, but they're there just in case they want to use them. And the idea is that these are degenerate people. You know, there's too many morons. Uh, who was it? Uh, famous Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said something like, uh, you know, I forget the exact quote, but seven generations of morons is enough, you know. And, uh, uh, but, you know, the fact is that although um, they have health problems, they're poor, they are a little bit inbred sometimes, and those, some of those genetic things, but they're just folks like other folks, you know. But what interested us about them, you know, from, I, I admit from a kind of romantic perspective, was the, precisely their, uh, their, the, the ways in which they threw light on the whole idea of community and intentional community. <clears throat> and we've been very pleased to see that in the 20th century, some of these folks have been able to overcome their own feelings of inferiority which have been drummed into them and you know you get situation well there's a beautiful book by a guy who grew up in a in a family where there was he thought there was always something they weren't telling him his parents and his aunts and uncles there was some mystery that the voices would fall silent when he came in the room kind of thing and he was all his life he went, what is going on and finally he pinned down one of his aunts and made her confess well, dear, you know, we're Melungeons, and we don't, like, we don't want anybody to know that, and that's why we've tried to bring you up not even knowing what your own heritage is so that you could be free of this burden. And he said, what's a Melungeon, as you were just indicating? <laughs> you know, and it, he was once one of these groups, you know. It's one of these groups. These, his branch had come down from the hills and tried to become normal folks. 
and they, they were trying to lose their past, which they considered to be uh, a disgrace. But he, probably under the influence of 60s you know, hippieism, decided that, hey, that sounds really cool. You know? So he went out and started to research the Melungeons, and he eventually he published a very interesting little book suggesting, among other things, some Islamic uh, background. Uh, his hypothesis was that um, that uh, uh, con uh, converted uh, Moors, the Moriscos, who came over as servants with the Spanish, may have run away into the woods and mingled with Indians, as so many people did in early America. The whole idea of the white Indian, you know, um, Cotton Mather, you know who he was, the, the uh, Puritan divine and uh, a Puritan minister in New England who was involved in burning witches and you know, not a very nice guy. Uh, and he once complained bitterly, he said that uh, uh, the Indians have stolen hundreds of our people but we've never been able to convert a single Indian to Christianity. And the idea was that uh, if you were on the bottom of the colonial totem pole, if you were a serf, uh, you know, what was so great about white society and European civilization that would keep you from running away and joining the Indians, who, who knew where to find food, who had no kings over them telling them what to do, you know, who had different ideas about sexuality and love, uh, who were clearly at home in this new world, where they felt not at home at all through the, you know. So the temptations to run away and become an Indian, if I can put that in quotes, uh, is one of the earliest impulses of American resistance. And that archetype keeps reappearing over and over and over again, and even taking apparently ridiculous forms like make-believe, you know, being make-believe Indians, the way Boy Scouts or, 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 you know, some of the fraternal organizations putting feathers on it, you know. Uh, there's a kind of deep romantic yearning behind even the silliest of those things, which I always think about when, when our Native American comrades accuse, accuse the hippies of appropriation. And I think, well, yes, that's true. Uh, as one of the Lakota Sioux uh, medicine men said, why don't you white people get a religion of your own? And there's some truth to that, you know, I'm not going to deny it, and I don't try to... I've learned not to try to uh, uh, act like an appropriator in regards to, uh, to, to these cultures, but uh, it seems to me they ought to take a little bit more heart in the idea that, in fact, for generations, white people have felt alienated in their own society and highly admiring of this other model. I mean, we actually think, we, you know, actually think that Indians live better than us. Well, that, shouldn't that be flattering to the Indians? Anyway. Uh, some of them are flattered by it, and they do understand, and they're sympathetic towards white people who, uh, you know, want, want to, uh, in, 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 in a uh, respectful way, want to participate on some level in these, in these mysteries, these nature mysteries. Uh, but o others are not. There's too much racism and too much bad feelings behind them, and I, I can't blame them for that. And their critique of appropriation has a lot of strong points to it. But I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I think it would be it would be it would be it would be too bad if white America decided that we had to ignore our entire Indian Native American heritage because of this problem. Um, it would be it, it would seem better to me to emphasize cases like some branches of the Cherokee who have welcomed in the runaways, the both black and white. Yeah, or the Seminoles, for example, did the same. And in fact, you know, even in the Iroquois Confederation, our local New York tribes, they wrote a constitution inspired by the Hiawatha. And some people say he wrote this constitution or verbally created it, and it was later written down. And one whole huge section of that constitution concerns adoption, how to adopt people into the Confederation, either by tribe or as individuals, as a whole tribe or as an individual. And they had, the whole thing was laid out, how to do it. They had no concept that to be an Iroquois meant that you had to have certain genes or certain bloodline. It was about the way you lived. If you lived like an Indian, you were an Indian and you could join the Confederation. And in fact, in a very 
as it turned out, very naive but charming move, the Iroquois Confederation actually inv invited France to join once as, as a uh, seventh nation. They were, they were surprised when they were turned down. <laughs> Later on, they found out that they had been misadvised. But in theory, it could have been done. In theory, you know, the white people of New York could have said, well, how about accepting us as the seventh tribe? <laughs> and then we have a, we'd have a very different America now than we do. Pure science fiction, obviously. And, uh, but nevertheless, at least as historians, I think we could look back on some of these strange maroon societies, these tri-racial societies, uh, so-called, and find inspiration rather than just looking on them as the failures of, you know, the failure stories of the great American march towards progress and democracy, which is how they've been interpreted in the past.